Okay, I'd like to thank the organizers for this great conference. So I'm talking on um, island filters for inference on meta population dynamics, and this is based on a recent submission to the archive. We have yet to see what the referees think of it. It's in collaboration with my PhD student, Kadoos Asfor, and Junha Park, who's here, and Aaron King. And this is the first time I've talked on, on this paper, so it's... Was it accepted by org <laughs> they, they, they kindly accepted it. They, they took a day to do it. Okay, so the topic here, it's, uh, our, our motivation is space-time data. We're thinking that maybe you have some number of cities or, or regions and um, epidemic going on, and most of the transmission is within a region, some transmission is between a region, and there are two main goals of studying this as a spatiotemporal system. One is that you have more data, so you can borrow strength between them to estimate parameters, and the other is that the coupling might be of interest. Now, the, the background here, it's a kind of a battle against the curse of dimensionality. So when you have low-dimensional data, there are these particle filter methods, which over the last um, couple of decades have become quite widely applicable. They're quite um, robust for inference on low-dimensional, nonlinear, partially observed stochastic dynamic systems. The problem is that they scale exponentially badly as the dimension goes up, and that's called the curse of dimensionality. And so um, I have three offerings for you of a, a sequence of algorithms to make some progress on the curse of dimensionality. We call them independent island filters and um, well, I guess we'll start with the names, and then the names will, will recur through the talk. One is called the Basic Island Filter, or BIF, and then there's the Ad Adapted Simulation Island Filter, ASIV, and then if you add uh, intermediate resampling, you get ASIV IR. And um, we, I have some empirical results and um, some theory that reinforces the idea that for weakly coupled populations, these things can um, beat the curse of dimensionality. Okay, so the class of models we're looking at here is the class of spat pumps. And a pump is a partially observed Markov process, also known as a state space model or a hidden Markov model, where you have a latent Markov process and then you have noisy observations of it. And a spat pump is simply a pump with some unit structure added. And the, the units, we're going to think of them as spatial units, but the general class of spat pumps, there could be any, any units you can think of. And so our latent marker process is indexed by space and time. U is the unit, which is space, and N is time. And we can think about it as discrete time, or the latent process is probably continuous time, so it's really x u of tn, but we're most interested in the latent state at the observation times, and the observations are discrete time, they are um, y u n, and we have the assumption that y u n depends only on x u n, so this is also an extension of the basic um, pump assumption, because measurements are defined in space and time rather than um, just in time. So here's a kind of uh, example of the, the kind of thing um, that was motivating us. This is a, a toy example in the sense it's simulated data. Suppose you have 40 units, that could be 40 cities of uh, measles, and this is a gravity model with uh, geography, demography, transmission parameters corresponding to UK pre-vaccination measles. It's a, a well-studied system, and you, you can just see here you have fairly synchronized epidemics every two years, and in some of the smaller cities, you might have some little fade-outs. When, when it goes black, that's kind of a fade-out. Um, okay, so, 
so before we uh, before I impose some algorithms on you, here's some uh, notation which will help set things up. So the, the class of models we're working with here are essentially arbitrary spat pump models. So all we're going to insist is that we have some simulator for the latent process X, which means writing F of Xn given Xn minus 1 as a kind of arbitrary transition density, we better be able to simulate that from our model. We also better be able to initialize it. We need an evaluator for the measurement density F y u n given X u n. And the fact that these are the algorithmic inputs, this is what we call the, the plug and play property. So it's, it's nice because it's relatively easy to develop simulators for models, and it's also relatively easy to write general purpose software in that context because people can bring in a simulator. Yeah. So the number of pylons is not equal to the number of units. Right. Now, um, we're going to... That, that's right. So the term island is kind of unfortunate because if you come from an ecological perspective, you're thinking of island as maybe... Um, geographical units that don't connect. This is island in the Monte Carlo sense of um, Monte Carlo uh, uh, components that don't connect. So if you have a particle filter, all, all the particles have to talk to each other. There's resampling, uh, and so it doesn't trivially parallelize. Essentially, an algorithm that easily parallelizes, so you can have something going on here, something going on here, something going on here. So the right way to think of islands in this context is that the islands are um, CPUs, and, the, and the, uh, the algorithm has to distribute across islands. Uh, this, this kind of annoys my e ecologist collaborators, because they keep wanting island to be something else. And, I, I, I know if we wanted to change the name, it's too late now because it's on archive. But yes, that's um, may, maybe the referees will insist on a name change. Um, okay, so so we're going to have a number of islands. There's a neighborhood structure which we're going to call B U N, and this is a set of time points that is time and space points that's important for knowing what's going on at UN. The idea is that because of the, because of the, some sort of a mixing in space and time, if you're sufficiently far away, then you have relatively little impact at some other um, space and time. There's going to be data, there's going to be particles per island, which we'll always use J for. When you have intermediate resampling, which I'll tell you what that is before, but you're going to have to know how many times you're doing intermediate resampling, and that's going to be S. So that's our introduction to the letter S. The as if IR needs some moment, um, some local moment approximations too. Uh, again, so for, to some people's intuition, this doesn't seem so plug and play, because I told you you just need a simulator. Now I'm saying, well, you need some local moment approximations. But these local moment approximations are fairly simple things like you need your measurement model to have a nicely parameterized mean and variance. Well, most measurement models we use have those. So, so those, are, those are not obstacles, whereas having a closed form for the transition probabilities of your nonlinear system, that would be an obstacle. OK, so the output that we're going to consider of these algorithms is a log likelihood estimate. It's a Monte Carlo log likelihood estimate. That's why it has the MC there. And this is based, this is going to be based on, on some um, decomposition of the log likelihood. Sometimes when you're filtering, you're interested in estimating the latent state. We're primarily motivated by inference. So our, our kind of, the thing we most want to do is estimate the likelihood. The two problems are very closely related because the likelihood comes from integrating out over the latent, the filtered latent state. When I show you some algorithms, I, I have to just tell you this convention I'm going to use, the implicit loops. Well, as soon as you have space and time and particles and intermediate time steps, you get a whole lot of loops going on. And it's kind of a pain to write out all the loops. And so we write implicit loops where if you have a free index, which is little u for 1 to big U, little n for 1 to big n, little i for 1 to big i, little j for 1 to big j, you don't have to write out the for loop. You just write the free index. And it's accepted that you're 
uh, iterating over that loop. Well, the, the basic island filter is a um, remarkably simple algorithm. You, uh, you might even, it, it seems almost too simple. So in the basic island filter, each island is just a simulation of the space-time process. And the measurement weights are the, uh, are the measurement model evaluated at each point of space and time. And then we combine them locally using these uh, neighborhoods B. This is, this is kind of where the, uh, where the weak coupling comes in because these somehow have to be sufficient to get a good estimate of the likelihood. And then you take those weighted estimates and that is your... That's your likelihood. This is this I think is um, of the three algorithms we're going to we're going to see today. This is probably one that I hope you can kind of understand what's going on in real time. It it's simple. It may or may not be useful, but it's quite readily um, comprehensible. the The surprising thing about this algorithm is that. Although it's naive in some ways, it does have some nice properties for beating that curse of dimensionality that was killing the particle filter. So uh, what we discovered, we, we introduced this kind of as a theoretical toy. We were going to study more complex algorithms, and we needed a way to prove theorems about the complex algorithms. We figured if we couldn't prove anything about the very simplest version, we were out of luck. Um, but so then once we followed that agenda, we proved some things about it. When we did the numerical results, we figured we should actually try implementing it too. And on some interesting models, uh, BIF turned out to be a, a reasonably effective algorithm. Um, okay, so BIF, BIF deals reasonably well with the spatial scaling, U. But people who think about particle filters would be surprised about this algorithm because the simulations are unconditional on the data. The simulations don't have to follow the data. The whole reason why particle filter methods work well is because they do follow the data. And so although maybe something scales well in space, you've lost something in time. And that's true, but it just happens that with, with modern computers, sometimes you can generate a large enough number of particles that just the sheer weight of particles deals with the time issue. And then if you don't get killed exponentially on the space side, then, uh, then that can still work out for you. Anyway, so, so that's the algorithm. It's, I think it, it gets across some of the, of the key idea of how we can beat the curse of dimensionality in space and it um, uh, and it's it's worth thinking about using. But this is the algorithm that uh, initially we we expected to be better because we we want to take advantage of the way Biff helps out in space, but also track the space time data in time as well. The assumption here is that we cannot do true filtering. Nobody knows how to get a, um, a true global filter for these problems. So you don't try. You have to find some weaker way of tracking the data uh, that, that isn't the full filtering problem, but that can be combined across multiple Monte Carlo islands in order to get a solution to, um, to the filtering problem. And so the thing that is not the filtering problem but is a bit easier than the filtering problem is called the adapted simulation problem. And here it is. We, the, fil the filtering thing is trying to get the full distribution of xn given yn and previous data. Here we don't try to do that, but we just want to do a sort of one-step greedy simulation. So it's some, essentially local in space and time to draw from this adapted simulation distribution. And then the adapted simulation island filter, as if, uh, uses important sampling to carry out one adapted simulation on each island. So the particles per island, the J, is really the number of draws we use for that adapted simulation. And then if you properly weight these things and then localize the proper weights, 
you can use the, the same trick that Biff uses to beat the curse of dimensionality in space, and then you're tracking these things in time a little bit. And so hopefully that's going to work better. The, the algorithms start becoming more complex. Uh, it gets to be more of a, more of a headache to internalize this um, real time. This is, if you've seen, if you've seen particle filters, this, you'll, you'll get this quicker because a, a lot of these steps look very much like particle filtering. The, the thing that makes this different from a regular particle filter, one of the main things is in this resampling step on each island, we resample down to one particle. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I probably should do a, I'm going to, you know, talking a lot about comparisons with sequential Monte Carlo, but one can't necessarily guarantee everybody in this room has seen um, sequential Monte Carlo. I'm curious for a show of hands, how many of you have kind of seen or done sequential Monte Carlo a little bit? Hmm. Maybe two thirds, so I'll, I'll um, th this, this, this will be a, a, a tough talk if, if you haven't seen sequential Monte Carlo because we're going the next step. Um, so in, in sequential Monte Carlo, you would, you would try to keep all the particles, and so you would really try to get a true um, representation of, that would give you a true representation of the full filtering distribution. And then the as if is basically saying, give up on that, that scales exponentially badly, that doesn't work. But if you, if you solve this slightly easier problem, then it's going to scale better, and then you, then you combine across multiple islands, and then you still uh, are approximating a, um, a true filter, the approximation being up to this neighborhood, BUN. Because the, if the neighborhood were infinitely large, then you would, have, you would have a true unbiased Monte Carlo estimate of the likelihood, but then you get killed by the, the curse of dimensionality still kicks in on BUN. So the assumption is that you can find a BUN that, that's small enough that the, that part of the curse of dimensionality doesn't kill you and big enough that it contains uh, practically all the information. Okay, so I'm going to add in intermediate resampling now, and the idea here is that although as if tracks the data some amount, and the that intermediate that that um, adapted simulation step still suffers from a curse of dimensionality. So, intermediate resampling is a way to do that adapted simulation step better, and. Uh, it's a kind of surprising thing that if you split time into subintervals and resample at subintervals, it actually has some, some power against the curse of dimensionality. Uh, intermediate resampling has, has been found to be uh, useful empirically. Uh, Pierre Del Moral and Lawrence Murray kind of discovered it for, in the context of a perfectly observed diffusion setting and then um, and then Junha worked a bunch on that in the context of filtering. If you, if you just try to use intermediate sampling within a, within a particle filter, you get uh, the guided intermediate resampling filter or GERF algorithm. And that's, that's what we're going to compare our island filters with because GERF is, you know, as far as particle filters go with scaling for space time, that's as good as it gets. I'm not going to trouble you with the details of the <laughs> as if I are code because it's a, it's a little bit involved, but it's in some sense it's kind of surprising that you can actually prove theorems about such an algorithm, but I'll, I'll give you a theorem as long as I may remember not to run out of time. But I want to, I want to give you some examples too. The examples are going to be carried out using the spat pump package, which attends to spat pump models, and it's an extension of the pump package. And in the same way, the spat pump class extends the, the pump class. So those of you who've tried 
um, using pump, well, you can use pump on spat pump models, which is kind of a nice thing. There's, I think there's some general uh, uh, perception that, and I think it's, it's correct, that anything with space-time models is hard, right? And so um, having, some, having some software to help you, it, it, it's still hard, but it, it helps you along. So anyway, that's what, that's what we use, and the, the spat pump package is now on GitHub, so you're welcome to try playing with it if you feel inclined. Here's a toy example of u-dimensional correlated Brownian motion. This is, a, this is a nice toy example because we can actually Kalman filter to get the actual likelihood. And we can see here how the particle filter, which is this pink line, hits a cursive dimensionality. We can see here's the Kalman filter. That's the exact log likelihood. And um, when you when you have really low dimension, the particle filter is a really good algorithm, and the GERF um, is a good approximation to that. As soon as the dimension starts going up, these things start doing worse. And on this particular example, it's as if I are. That, uh, that manages to scale well. Okay, so here's our measles example. This is the same simulated data that I showed you earlier. The, the log likelihood per observation goes up, in fact, because city sizes go down. City one is London. By the time you get to city 40, it's a bunch smaller. Smaller cities have fewer cases, therefore higher likelihood. So, so you kind of expect this um, slope. And this is really the kind of model that the methods uh, work well on, because measles is quite weakly coupled. There's some transmission between cities, but not a whole lot. And so here you see when you have, when you have a small number of cities, these island filters kind of match the particle filter, which also presumably, it's a very good algorithm in that case, presumably it's correct. The particle filter bombs pretty soon and goes, goes south very fast because of the curse of dimensionality, but these island filters do their thing. And, uh, and the, the GERF, which the particle filter-like thing, is somewhere in between. Okay. Um, there may be models that are that are not kind of epi ecological um, meta population models that still have space time and maybe a little bit more coupling. This is uh, this is showing you what happens in in that case. This is the Lorentz ninety six toy atmospheric model. This is this is a an example that the um, geophysics community like, because it, it has chaos and you can try filtering it. Um, and these island filters still do reasonably well in this case. In fact, not quite as well uh, for high dimensions as the ensemble Kaman filter. This, this ensemble Kaman filter would maybe be a go-to algorithm for the, uh, for, the, for the geophysicists. But the ensemble Kaman filter kind of assumes uh, Gaussian measurement noise and and a nonlinear system with additive Gaussian process noise and this Lorentz model has both of these so this is kind of a best case for the Lorentz model the for the um, ENKF and the ENKF struggles more when you have the kind of non-Gaussian models discrete models that we usually use for um, uh, epidemiological systems. Okay, so I've been talking about filtering more than inference, but estimating the log likelihood is a kind of key step to, to get to inference. Uh, if you have a particle filter or GERF, then you can perturb the parameters, iterate, and then you get an MLE, and, and that's kind of a nice thing. If you, if you feel like doing Bayesian analysis, you can do particle Markov chain Monte Carlo, but Given, the, given how hard it is to evaluate each likelihood, doing that the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times you need to for particle MCMC is going to be tough. So 
extending iterative filtering to island filters is, is not yet done, but getting, getting the likelihood is a good starting point. So we can already start um, doing some things just with the ability to get at the likelihood. The likelihood somehow measures all the information in the data about whatever you're studying. So just by, just by looking at the model, you can see how well different things are estimated. And here we can look at the space-time measles model, two parameters. The G here is the, uh, is the gravity constant for the coupling. And the um, mu IR is the recovery rate. And so you can see that for this particular model, Mu IR is, is very well identified. This here is um, of order hundreds of log units. And so the, the Monte Carlo error is relatively small on that scale. If you want to get at the coupling, there's not a huge amount of information on the coupling, even from all this space-time data, mostly because the information on the coupling is all when the uh, when the epidemics are low. So the basic information from the coupling is probably that London is above the critical community size. So when you have fade outs in other regions, then, then the measles comes in from London and starts it up again. So somewhere in the troughs, there's information about the coupling. And this tells us, yes, there is information about the coupling. You can use this to estimate the coupling using likelihood-based methods, which I guess people haven't been able to do before. So that's kind of fun, but the information on the coupling is more of the order of 10 uh, log likelihood units. And so the, even using the best available filters, you have to kind of see through the noise. So you have to fit these curves through the, the likelihood. And this, is, this was based on a week of um, computing the likelihood. So you can't, you can't really get the Monte Carlo error much smaller than that. Okay. So I, I promised you some, a, a theorem as well as um, some empirical results. So, so here is a, um, here's a theorem which it's really just an advertisement for the archive preprint because all, of course, everything, everything is, is in the assumptions and the assumptions are too long to list here. And the bottom line is, yes, you get a, a central limit theorem that says that up to some approximation error, then you, uh, you have a, a normal error on the log likelihood and you can kind of control the, uh, you get some bias from the fact that you're only conditioning on a finite neighborhood, not the whole thing. But as long as your neighborhood is good enough or your, your system is sufficiently weakly coupled that you only need to look at close things, then uh, everything works out. And the critical thing here is that the scaling is not exponential. So you get a, um, a linear bias, you get a variance, that depending exactly on your assumptions might be quadratic. If you have nicely weakly coupled things, it's linear, but in, in neither way is it exponential. So in that sense, if you did a, a particle filter and you looked at how it scaled with you, it would be exponentially bad. Um, so I think that is where I'll end. I'll thank you for your attention. Some. Yeah. So it seems like the, the important assumption is that you can have a large number of these islands available in order for, for the CLT to kick in. How, how difficult or easy is it for you to have islands available for the typical Hong Kong? So, sufficiently oh. large number so like right, and the size of each island. Um, scales with uh, how many particles you have on each island, uh, the the dimension of the system. I think this is one of this is one of the reasons why what we're trying to do for these epi models it's different from what the geophysicists want to do. So we want we want flexibility 
and you know, we want to be able to fit our quite non-linear, quite non-Gaussian models, but we're not trying here to deal with the state spaces of, say, dimension 10 to the 7 that the, uh, that the geophysicists might want to do. If we can do 50 cities, and maybe each city has f 5 or 10 compartments, then, then we're happy. And once we're doing that, yes, we, we probably want at least 1,000 islands. But, yeah, but more generally, how do you, so they are very nice, but how in practice, how do you tune them? Because they are, um, I mean, how do you know uh, exactly the number of particles used really in practice? How, how do you know you've done enough? Yeah, and so, how so to, that, that's, that's always how not to spend the days and days of tuning. Well, one thing you do know is what your computer budget is. Okay. So in practice, in practice, you, you know, you, you use everything that you've got right, and you have, a, you have a question, and you do the best you can. So, so one of the things you can do, which is actually a nice thing of, wor of working in this pump spat pump system, if you want to know that, what your, that your thing is working, it's nice to take a low-dimensional version and calibrate it against P-filter, because the particle filter on small problems it, as long if you take the, the situation where your problem is small enough that it hasn't beat the, the, the cursor dimensionality hasn't kicked in, then you can essentially benchmark against the truth. So you can check how good your neighborhood is uh, on low dimensions, and then it take advantage of the good scaling properties that things basically scale fairly linearly with you uh, for, these, for these filters. Okay. So if you don't get killed at small u, then it's going to help you at big U. And for instance, for the comparison that you showed at the, at the moment, comparison between the, the different methods, how did you, what is fixed here? I mean, uh, for instance, number of particles is the same for all? Uh, OK. Uh, that's in the supplement. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, so you need to somehow control computational effort. The the bottom line measure for, for most of these methods, for, for all the filter methods, we basically allow it a certain amount of CPU hours. And that depends on the implementation. We can't guarantee that every method is implemented equally well, but you, you have to do something. So of course, you can't do that for the Kalman filter because the Kalman filter is instant. When, when you're comparing with the ensemble Kalman filter to um, that is, uh, that basically just uh, takes less long. And then it, you know, the, the gains you get from adding time with the ensemble camera filter are different. And then there are other complications like you're, you're constrained not only by time, but also by memory. And the, the particle filter has more memory problems and more communication problems because these other algorithms parallelize basically trivially. So it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's always hard to know how to compare algorithms, but the, I, I guess at some point you have to trust people to give each algorithm the best shot given the available resources. Hi, Ed. Um, I was just curious, because I think I have a slightly different characterization of the central problem uh, with particle filtering for many of these high-dimensional problems than you described. And it's that it's not just that the latent space, those variables, is high-dimensional, but it's also that the data can be very informative at points in time about these latent variables. So I, I think of it as the curse of high dimensionality with also highly informative data, such that you can simulate under your process model to reasonably describe the, the prior distribution of your latent variables. But then once you've actually observed the data, the posterior distribution or the filtering distribution of your latent variables uh, becomes yeah. uh, much constrained, such that previously your, your prior distribution on latent variables was a very high entropy distribution, but then that collapsed to a very low entropy distribution yes. centered around certain values that your data are more or less telling you that your system has to be in that particular state at that particular time. And so my question is, I was wondering if the as if or as if IR um, particle filters help with that sort of problem at all. So intermediate resampling helps. So yes, the 
so the, the classic particle depletion problem without the number of units going up, right, is informative, um, highly informative observations. We call that the curse of too much information. And in some sense, that is actually what's going on in the space-time case too, because all, all the units that you have are basically the information is piling up. And the basic particle filter can only assimilate so much information at a time before the important sampling problem gets close to singular. So the, the um, Del Morel and Murray paper that I cited here basically considers intermediate resampling as an approach to deal with the curse of too much information, which is the problem you describe. So, yes, in particular, the GERF algorithm addresses that issue um, and I think has some, has some nice properties as the, as the measurements get informative, but not necessarily high dimensional. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So in this particular case, they are the largest 40 cities, yeah. uh, and that's in part because that's what Brian Grenfell put on the web. Um, and they're not actually quite the largest 40 cities. They are the largest 40 cities, excluding some large cities that are close to London. So they're, they're, that's kind of um, not, not allowing things to bunch too close to London. But I think maybe your point, which is a good one, is that the, you'd get more information about the coupling parameter if you put small cities in there. Now... That your question also lets me say something about how this relates to other analyses of uh, measles metapopulation dynamics. The, if you allow yourself some nice linearizations, then you can do all 900 cities in the, in, in, in the full uh, data set. Then you have to make some approximations that you can't really test within that structure. So there's, there's definitely some, some playing you could do here. This was more of a test of methodology. I'm not necessarily claiming any kind of scientific discoveries. We, we, have, an, we have an agenda to uh, use these methods for, uh, for, for space-time analysis of dengue. Maybe next time I get to speak, I'll be telling you how this gets used for data analysis. <coughs> Other questions? You have a question? Yeah. When you showed at the end, or mostly at the end, um, um, a graph on the flies likelihood, the estimation of J, the, the coupling, the gravitational coupling, yeah. and I did not understand which were the data. So you simulated data, but which were the observations here? Did you observe everything? Or yeah, just 40, 40 cities. Yeah, 40 cities, but what uh, the number of infections? Were oh, so you, so you mm -hmm. observe reported cases. Uh, only reported cases. In all cases, you observe only reported, I mean. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think that's, at least for historical measles, the, yeah, yeah, there's okay. this classic data set of reported cases. So we mimicked uh, this yeah. kind of data. Yeah. And you don't have any, uh, I mean, theoretical way to say that this is an either identifiable or not? Uh, I mean... Well, no, we've shown there's information, is, yeah. look, because the, the, the likelihood is not flat. No, so, you're right. But, uh, so it is, it is identifiable. Okay. Thank you. So let's thank you again.